the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is the testimony given by John the Baptist. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. John the Baptist is a powerful, imposing figure. He was strong in his convictions, literally worn on his sleeve of camel's hair. At first glance, it's easy to think that his power came from his charisma, his curious way of life attracted and inspired many. But there's more to him than that. As Mark Cooper pointed out in his sermon last week, John was a priest kid. But he didn't just grow up in the temple and know the religious authorities personally. Being a priest's son meant that he too was a priest. Born of the lineage of Aaron, John received priesthood as his inheritance. John the Baptist took his knowledge of the priesthood, his inherited religious authority, and walked with it into the wilderness. It's no secret to both Christian and Jewish scholars that in John's day there was rampant corruption among the religious authorities who were in league with corrupt political leaders themselves. These leaders, out of fear or greed, used religion and God to enforce ungodly oppressive and empty rules and rights. So John the Baptist struck off to the desert to start anew. He geographically distanced himself from the temple's corruption and he set up shop in the wilderness, the place of Moses and Joshua's and Elijah's work, the place of God's intimacy with lost and wandering Hebrews. John went there to cleanse this religion of corruption. He baptizes a ritual of purification. And unlike the, the temple authorities that he left behind, John is no hypocrite. He starts with himself, living a harsh, ascetic life. <clears throat> Doing so, both in actions and words, John knowingly puts on the mantle of prophet. Just like the prophets of the Hebrew Bible, prophets were literally mouthpieces of God, literally spokespersons is what the word means in Hebrew. Their job was to speak and enact the timeless words of God to the people the religious authorities, and to kings alike. At times, they were words of comfort like we hear today from Isaiah. And often, the biblical prophets issued words of warning. But it's important that we don't simply hear these words of anger or warning without context. We have to ask, what made them and God angry? Amos, perhaps the angriest of the angry prophets, said this, Hear this, you that trample on the needy, and bring, ruin, bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain? And when will the Sabbath be over so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great, and practice deceit with false balances buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and selling even the sweepings of wheat. The anger is not lacking context. The anger is directed at corrupt leadership, corrupt systems that abused their power to exploit the poor. Those who profited from the poor's vulnerability. But it's not 
just there. The prophet's anger is also directed towards the religious leadership and the people who have disconnected their praise from their actions. Again, God says through Amos, I hate, I despise your religious festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an overflowing stream. In other words, the prophets are reminding us, just as the law did, that true religion aligns our actions with our prayers. Our religious life is not to be separate, compartmentalized, or disconnected from our daily life. There is no part of our lives that is free from the moral implications of following God. But these corrupt leaders misrepresented God's purposes, denied the law's priorities, and put stumbling blocks between the people and their true God. At its best, it's a lack of self-awareness. At its worst, it's spiritual abuse. Now in John the Baptist, the true power and authority of both the law and the prophets overlap. John is powerful with the word of God, and the Pharisees and the scribes know it. If anyone can identify what is godly and what is not, it's him. John speaks in the words that the Pharisees cannot miss. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Now you have to know some background to this passage here, why he chose it. At the exile to Babylon, 500 years before John, the very presence of the Lord, it is taught, left the land of Israel with the exiles, accompanying them into this strange land and people. This passage John chose from Isaiah was originally spoken to the Judeans who were returning to Jerusalem. This sentence meant that the presence of the Lord was now returning with the exiles to Jerusalem for a new start. For John to claim these ways, it not only meant that the presence of the Lord had not been with the Pharisees in their hypocritical worship. It did not just mean that they had twisted the law into a tool of death. But it also meant that the presence of the Lord was going to start again. Now the prophet's job was to bring the message. So what do we do with it? What do we do with it? What is our faithful response? For some people, it is to follow in John the Baptist's footsteps and speak truth to power, even to this day. And all of us are called to rejoice. Rejoice. Exult with our whole being in our God, Isaiah says in verse 10 today. Now you might be thinking, that sounds rather lighthearted after John's fierceness. You wouldn't be wrong to think that because we often associate joy and rejoicing with a, some type of shallow happiness. But Isaiah means something much deeper than that. Verse 11, he says, righteousness and praise. Righteousness meaning justice. Right actions that display God's glory, God's very presence. Presence. Build up ancient ruins, he says. Raise up devastations. Repair and renew ruined cities. Active words. Verbs of action. And praise. We are also called to praise. The Old Testament word for prayers 
ongoing prayers that continually, intentionally reset God's will as our first priority. Prayers that arise from actually, not just nominally, turned towards God. Prayers that comfort, prayers that challenge. Righteousness and praise, these two halves come together to form the one whole of our being. The one is incomplete without the other. And as we grow into this new reality, our actions become prayers and our prayers become actions. This is how we pray without ceasing, as Paul says this morning. Or as Frederick Beekner put it, we follow where our best prayers lead. We follow where our best prayers lead. This is how we rejoice. This is how we rejoice with righteousness and praise brought together in one. This is the repentance that John the Baptist calls us to in this time. It is a challenge to corruption. It is light and hope in seasons of darkness. They prepare us to receive Christ in our hearts as individuals and as communities. The prophet has done his job. It is time for us to do ours. Rejoice and amen.